There is a phrase that we use in the English language to describe a reversal of fortune. It's a phrase used to describe the realization of the unexpected. When we say turning the tables, we're talking about changing a position of disadvantage into a position of advantage. It's a way that we describe flipping the script or experiencing a reversal of destiny. Now, in literature, when we look at a story that has a great reversal in it, it is called a peripety. And whether it is a tale of rags to riches or the underdog becoming the champion or going from last to first, we love to see the tables turned. Right now in the National Football League, we're experiencing a turning of the tables in the life of a rookie quarterback. You know the story. Brock Purdy was drafted in the last round with the last pick in the April draft. He was drafted 262nd, earning the title of Mr. What? Irrelevant, meaning we're never going to hear your name again. You've had your five minutes of fame. But then the 49ers starting quarterback went down. Then their backup quarterback went down. And in December, they had to turn to a rookie quarterback to end their season. You know what's going on. He's won eight straight victories. And today at 2 o'clock, he plays in the NFC Championship game. And he's one week away from leading his team to the Super Bowl, I would say that he's turned the tables. How about you? No longer Mr. Irrelevant. You see, we love a story. We love a narrative that features a reversal. You could say that it's in our blood as Americans. You could say it's our American story. And I'm going to suggest to you today that at the heart of our faith, we are people who love to see the tables turned. You know, the Bible loves to tell stories of great reversals, stories telling of a higher power intervening in the lives of people by his sovereign hand and providence, stories where he rules and overrules on behalf of his people to enact his divine will. The scriptures are full of great reversals. We saw it in the life of Joseph. When Joseph went from the prison to the palace. We saw it in the story between Moses and Pharaoh as Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt and under the bondage of Pharaoh through the Red Sea to the promised land. We saw it in the life of a young boy named David who defeated a mighty warrior named Goliath with only a, a stone and a sling. And we saw it in the life of Jesus as he ministered. He turned the tables again and again in the lives of people just by his word or his touch. He changed the, the lives of a family at a wedding by changing water to wine. He calmed the storms on the sea, giving his disciples peace. He made the lame walk. He enabled the blind to see. The Bible repeatedly teaches us a simple truth, that God is able to turn the tables for our good. He's in the habit of flipping the script, he enacts great reversals on our behalf. And maybe you need to hear that this morning. Maybe you're facing some scary circumstances in life or some incredible difficulties. Maybe you find yourself in a situation where there's little time or few resources and little hope. Or maybe you've just made a mess of your life and you could use a second chance, or a fresh start. I want you to open your Bibles this morning to the book of Esther. My name's Sam Hannon. I'm one of the teaching pastors here at Fellowship. If you're new, I'd love to meet you. This is our fourth and final week studying this Old Testament narrative. And what we're going to see today as we finish and summarize the book is that it is filled with reversals. Over and over again, we see the flipping of the script in this story of Esther. Over and over again, God turned the tables. Let, remind, let me remind you of a few of them, and as I do, we'll walk back through the story. Chapter 1, 
We saw a great reversal, a flipping of the script, a turning of the tables in the life of Queen Vashti. Do you remember Queen Vashti? The scriptures say that she was hot. It does. I mean, come on. And her husband, King Xerxes, he was at a banquet. It was really a kegger. In fact, if you look throughout the book of Esther, King Xerxes was always throwing ragers. And he was usually drunk when he made a decision. So he's drunk at a banquet and he wants to show off to his friends. So he calls for Queen Vashti. Why? Just to show off her beauty. And you know what Queen Vashti said? No, I'm not coming. So she went from queen to being banished from the kingdom. First reversal. But then we also have a reversal in the life of an orphan refugee named Esther. A a woman living in exile under the care of her cousin who's become her father figure. And she goes from poverty to being the new queen at Xerxes' side. And her cousin slash father figure, Mordecai, also experienced a great reversal on his own accord. You see, he went from being hated, from being reviled by the the second in command in the kingdom of Persia. His name was Haman, to being exhausted, exalted in the kingdom by Xerxes. You see, Mordecai would not bow down to Haman, and Haman hated him. And so he was going to oppress Mordecai and his people. But Mordecai had actually saved King Xerxes' life by overhearing a plot of a coup. And King Xerxes elevated him to second in command. So what happened to Haman? Well, Haman experienced a great reversal too. He went from being the second in command, the second most powerful man in the most powerful kingdom in the world, the kingdom of Persia, to being executed for his treachery and his lies. Well, the the last reversal we see in the story we saw last week, and it happened with a group of people. You see, Mordecai and Esther were of the Jewish people. And Haman not only wanted to execute Mordecai, but he decided that he would eliminate, he would annihilate all of Mordecai's people. And the last great reversal we saw was that the Jewish people were saved, and they went from the possibility of annihilation to be given permission for retribution. And it's this last reversal that we'll study today. So go to Esther chapter nine. We'll pick up the story in verse one. It says this. On the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, the edict commanded by the king was to be carried out. So we're in the 13th day. This is the Hebrew calendar of the month of Adar, and this was a critical date. This was the date when the edicts of the king became law. This was the date when they became legal, when they were commenced, when they were put into effect. This date was actually chosen by Haman, the the evildoer who cast the poor or the die or the, the lot, and the date was chosen. Now, which edict is chapter 9, verse 1, referring to? Because there's actually two edicts in the story, let me remind you. The first one was Haman's edict. You find that in chapter 3. It says this, Dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order, the edict, to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, on a single day, the 13th day of the month of Adar, and then to plunder their goods. And a copy of that edict went out to all peoples in Persia. That's the first edict suggested by Haman, bought with a bribe, and it called for the annihilation of all Jewish people in the Persian kingdom. This was Haman's revenge against Mordecai for not bowing to him. Not if you're with me. But then God did a great work. Esther made queen, Mordecai honored. And they used their position. Remember in chapter four, Caleb taught us that maybe they were put in that position for what? A time such as this. 
And they went to the king and they asked for a second edict. And this is the edict that Esther suggested. The king's edict in chapter 8 granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and protect themselves, to destroy, kill, and annihilate the armed men of any nationality or province who might attack them or their women or their children. And then they could plunder the property of their enemy. So the second edict suggested by Esther, advised by Mordecai, gave the Jewish people the right to assemble and the right to defend themselves and defeat their enemies. And that edict too commenced or became legal on the 13th day of Adar. Well, why didn't they just cancel the first edict? Well, that was impossible in this nation, the nation of Persia. An edict of the king could not be retracted. It could not be rescinded, but a balancing edict could be issued, and this was Esther's strategy to save her people. So here's where we're at in the story. We have two competing edicts, both commencing or becoming legal on the 13th day of Adar. So we're hanging by a thread over this narrative, and it's all going to come to a head. Do you want to hear how the story ends? Let's continue back to chapter 9. What happened to the Jewish people. So on the 13th day of the 12th month of Adar, the edict, I would say edicts, commanded by the king were to be carried out. And on this day, the, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them. They had waited for months to enact Haman's evil edict. But now, what happened? The tables were turned. And the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. So on the day of judgment, the day chosen by Haman casting the poor or the, the lot, the tables were turned. The, the script was flipped. The greatest and final reversal in the book of Esther came to be. And the Jewish people were saved from their enemies. And their enemies actually began to fear for their own, their own lives because the hunted had now become the hunters. The details are described in verses two and three. It says the Jews assembled in their cities and in all the provinces of King Xerxes to attack those who were determined to destroy them. They were defending themselves. And it says that no one could stand against them. Does that sound familiar? Hold on to that phrase. No one could stand against them because the people of all other nationalities were afraid of them and all the nobles of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and the king's administrators helped the Jews because fear of Mordecai had seized them. The Jewish people who once kept their identity concealed or hidden in the kingdom of Persia now openly assembled and freely defended themselves. And the public officials of Persia swung to their side and supported them. They came to their aid they, because they respected, even feared Mordecai, who had been now elevated from the most hated man in the kingdom to prime minister, second man in command in the, the, the nation of Persia, the right-hand man of King Xerxes. And echoing what was said in Joshua of the Israelites as they took possession of the promised land, no one could stand against them. Do you remember when the Lord said that to Joshua? That go take the promised land, no one will be able to stand against you. And do you remember the setting of the conquest when Joshua led the Israelites into the promised land? It says in the book of Joshua that the people who were living in the land were melting in fear before them. Now, I wonder if this fear of Mordecai, if this inability to stand against the Jewish people who've never held a weapon, who have no military Training. I wonder if this fear, this inability to stand against them has more to do with their God than it does with their own strength or might. Now, 
In the book of Esther, this is the one book in the Bible that never mentions the word what? God. It's a spiritually sterile book. Not only does it not mention God, it doesn't mention worship. It doesn't mention prayer. It doesn't mention the temple. And it doesn't mention the law. And the setting of the book is completely outside of the promised land. So people wonder, where's God? You know, and as I look up here and see these two verses, I can't help but see God's presence in them. I wonder if the people were not fearing the Jews as much as they were fearing the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob who led them out of Egypt and through the Red Sea. I wonder if their fear had more to do with the Almighty than it did with the might of the Jews. Back to the story. The tables had been turned The destiny of the people of God had been reversed. Their disadvantage had been turned into advantage. So on the 13th and 14th days of Adar, the battle commenced. Look at verse 5, which summarizes it nicely. It says the Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and they did what pleased to those who hated them. The Jews were not only spared from annihilation, they were actually given retribution. They eliminated those who hated them and were planning to attack them and to destroy them. And they preserved a secure future by eradicating those who intended to harm them. And the battles lasted two days. In the story, Esther actually goes back to King Xerxes and asks for a second day to battle in the city of of Susa. Now only the sovereign and providential hand of God could bring about this kind of deliverance. What a day. A day when the people of God were saved from destruction. A day when the sovereign hand of God intervened to preserve his people. And it's a day that should never be forgotten. And Mordecai and Esther made sure that it would forever be remembered. In fact, I think the purpose of the book of Esther is to forever remember these days when the Jews were saved. So Mordecai and Esther enacted a plan to do just that, to forever remember. Look at verse 20. It says, Mordecai recorded these events and he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes near and far to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies and as a month when their sorrow turned to joy, when their mourning turned into a day of celebration and he wrote to them to observe the days as days of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So Mordecai called for a formal remembrance of their being rescued. He called for a feast that was to be celebrated annually, a day to remember their deliverance, a day to commemorate sorrow turning to joy. So he declared that the 14th and the 15th days of the Hebrew month of Adar should be days of resting, remembrance, commemoration, and feasting. Now that the tables had been turned, the tables were to be spread in every home and filled for feasting. Now, you may have noticed, because I know that you're all biblical scholars, that in the book of Esther, the concept of a banquet or a feast is featured over and over. Did you notice that? 17 different times in our 10 chapters, we find ourselves at a feast or a banquet. The book started with a feast. That's where Vashti was deposed. The book ends in a feast, Mordecai calling for two days of celebration, and the story actually turned at a feast. It was Esther who threw a feast and invited Haman and turned the tables on him in front of King Xerxes. So Mordecai called for a feast. Of course he did. We're in the book of Esther. And everyone was on board. Look at verse 23. It says that, The Jews agreed. 
They agreed to continue the celebration they had begun, doing what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agite, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them, and he had cast the poor, that is the lot, for their ruin and destruction. But when the plot came to the king's attention, he issued written orders that the evil scheme of Haman devised against the Jews should come back on his own head and that he and his son should be impaled on poles. I love the Bible. It's so cool. Before the Game of Thrones, we were impaling people. (laughs) Now these days were called Purim for the word poor. So the annual feast derived its name from the lot, the poor, that Haman cast. Purim is the plural form of this Persian word describing that die. And so the feast was to be celebrated by all generations of the Hebrew people to come. Verses 27 and 28 describe the feast in greater detail. The Jews took it upon themselves to establish the custom that they and their descendants and all who joined them should without fail Observe these two days every year. In the way described and at the time appointed, these days should be remembered and observed in every generation, by every family, in every province, and in every city. And these days of Purim should never fail to be celebrated by the Jews, nor should the memory of these days die out among their descendants, which include you and me. When God does something big, when he does something transformational, when he does something life-changing that is extraordinary, when he shows up in an unbelievable manner, we should mark that day and we should celebrate and we should remember and never forget. So the Hebrew people, they are to take two days each year to remember their deliverance. They are to celebrate a festival because in the story, Esther and Mordecai called for it. Why two days? Well, Esther asked for an extra day of battle. So some people celebrated on the 14th and some people celebrated on the 15th in the citadel of Susa. So it's a two-day festival. And guess what? It's coming up. March 6th and 7th, 2023 is the Feast of Purim for the Hebrew people. You can join in if you wish. Well, Sam... How would I celebrate the Feast of Purim? I'm glad you asked. First, fast on March 5th. That's the day of battle. Then on the 6th and 7th, read the book of Esther completely. Um, And by the way, one of the things they do is they read the book of Esther from the scroll of Esther in the temple and they invite the children to bring noisemakers like tambourines or or sticks or uh, different shakers. And every time the name Haman is mentioned, they all boo, hiss, and shake their (laughs) noisemakers to blot out his name forever. Some Jews write the name of Haman on the sole of their shoe so they can scrape his name out forever. So read the book of Esther. Boo Haman and then eat special foods like Hamantaschen. Has anybody in here ever had Hamantaschen? Yeah, Northwest Arkansas. Anybody ever had a pulled pork sandwich? (laughs) Yes. We don't have a lot of Jewish foods here. Well, what's a Hamantaschen? Well, it's a triangular shaped pastry. Well, why triangular? Well, it's supposedly representing one of two things. One would be Haman's hat that they believe was triangular in shape or... Haman's ears, which were cut off by Xerxes before he was impaled on the pole. So eat special food like hamantaschen or Doritos. Those are triangular. (laughs) I was trying to think, what else is triangular? Doritos are triangular. You also exchange gifts with others. You give gifts to the poor And in Israel, when we were there in 2019, some of you were with me, we were there during the Feast of Purim. And we saw all the children marching around in Halloween-type costumes. And so it is their Halloween. Well, why do they wear costumes? Because the Jewish people had to conceal themselves. And they're remembering that. 
So the point of the feast is to remember God's deliverance, to commemorate God's rescue. The book closes in chapter 10 with three verses uh, that are summary statements of King Xerxes and his prime minister Mordecai. King Xerxes imposed tribute throughout the empire to its distant shores. And all his acts of power and might, together with the full account of the greatness of Mordecai, whom the king had promoted, are they not written in the books of the annals of the kings of Medea and Persia? Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Xerxes, preeminent among the Jews and held in high esteem by his many fellow Jews because he worked for the good of the people and he spoke for the welfare of all the Jews. Well, there you have it, the book of Esther. An incredible tale of the deliverance of God's people that remind us of a really simple truth that I think we all need to hear. God is able. His sovereignty, his providence is able to turn the tables for our good. He's willing to flip the script. Maybe you've experienced it. Or maybe you're here today and you just need to hear that. You need to hear that there's no challenge too great, no adversity too severe for our almighty God, that he is able to enact great reversals. He is capable of changing the course of the plot of our stories. Is that good news or what? Because maybe you're here today and you're heartbroken because you're in a relational conflict. Maybe it's in your marriage or in a relationship with one of your children or you're struggling with a friendship and there's bitterness and lack of forgiveness and you need desperately for God to turn the tables, to bring his healing touch. Or maybe you're facing some difficult circumstances ahead. You have a devastating diagnosis. You're grieving the loss of a loved one. You're downsized at work, and you're just crippled with grief and fear and anxiety. Or maybe you've already failed in your attempt to pull yourself up by the bootstraps in 2023. Maybe you committed to sobriety and you've already turned back to substance abuse. Maybe you committed to purity and you've already turned back to your porn addiction. Whatever you're facing, I just want you to know that God is in the business of flipping the script. At his core, he enacts great reverses, reversals. He turns the tables. And I want to invite you this morning. We'll have a time of prayer here in a minute. I just want to invite you to take whatever burden you're carrying and lay it at his feet this morning and ask him to work in your life. After all, the greatest reversal of all time the, the biggest turning of the table hands down no doubt occur between friday's cross and sunday's empty tomb amen he's able and it was that reversal the man on the cross the resurrected savior it was at that reversal the biggest turning of the tables that paved the way for the turning of the table spiritually in your life and in my life. Think about it. At the core of our faith, at the core of who we are as the church of God is the story of him reversing our destiny through the cross of Jesus. Because of our sin, we are deserving and destined for destruction. Sinful people, Deserving of the wrath of a holy God. But God flipped the script. He sent his son to live the life we should have lived. To die the death we should have died. So that we might become the righteousness of God. Romans 5.8 reminds us of the truth. That God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet what? Sinners. Christ died for us. It doesn't even make sense. While we were going our own way, while we had turned our back on him, deserving of his wrath, he gave us love and life and died in our place. 2 Corinthians 5.21 paints the picture beautifully. God made him who had no sin 
to be sin. He turned the tables, flipped the script, so that in him we might become the very righteousness of God. That is the doctrine of justification. And at the heart of the doctrine of justification is turning of the tables. Isaiah 53 says, the punishment that was placed upon him brought us peace. He credited our account with his righteousness and took our sin from us. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5 describe the great reversal. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive in Christ even while we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you've been saved. He flipped the script on our behalf. So is that your story? Are you here today because your destiny has been altered, because your fortune has been reversed, or are you just here playing church? You see, at the heart of who we are as a people is we're a people whose destinies have been altered forever by the man on the cross and the resurrected Savior. So I want to invite you. If you don't know Christ who came to die on your behalf, if you've never been given that new page in life, that second chance, in just a moment, I'm gonna give you a time to pray. And I would encourage you to confess your sin to him and profess your belief in the one he sent. You know, we're actually commanded to remember as well as a people. We have a ceremony. You could call it a feast, if you will. And the idea goes like this, that because the Lord turned the tables for us, we go to his table, the, the Lord's table to remember. And so we're gonna finish our service today taking communion. Would you bow with me in prayer? The elements will come to you, they're double cupped, hold those to the end and we'll take them together. And I just wanna give you a few moments between you and the Lord. Maybe you need to bring a burden to him this morning. And ask him to work on your behalf. Maybe you need to confess sin to him this morning. Maybe you need to profess belief in him this morning. Spend some time processing with him. Prepare your heart.